Good morning, everyone. So my name is Alex Matrosov, and let's talk about some hardcore stuff this morning, right? So my presentation is about uh, advanced threat evolution and actually how this evolution changing the defensive solutions and also changing the minds of researchers and direction of their research. Actually, this presentation I give um, Knot on off zone this summer, and then uh, Echo Party, its Argentinian conference in Buenos Aires, invite me for talk about these problems on Latin America. And after that, Platform Security Summit, where basically uh, a lot of silicon vendors and hardware developers being invited, we raise this attention and awareness about this problem and basically what kind of solutions we can develop together. And now at Def Camp, it's a really big pleasure for me to be invited on this stage and opening the technical talks today on the track one. And let's go about some background about me. So I'm chief offensive security researcher at NVIDIA, focusing mostly about breaking the stuff in the hardware and firmware side. Did a lot of stuff on malware research scene before and also have fun with reverse engineering more than 20 years. How I get the idea of this presentation and why? Actually, because I was starting my career as a reverse engineer, I was involved in a lot of stuff tied to the malware threats. And as a hardware security researcher, I currently see a lot of problems and blinding spots for defensive solutions. And uh, actually, you know, I get, get this analogy, it's an iceberg, right? And we have a security industry visibility point where current endpoints can detect persistence on the operating system level. We have a lot of mitigations like a secure boot to prevent booting, boot threats like a boot kits and some type of root kits. But modern persistence techniques tied to the firmware and hardware more and more, especially because we have this stuff coming in much more other directions, like, okay, we have a automotive, we have much more devices around our homes now, we have industrial IoT, and all the hotels and buildings getting smarter, right? And how we can protect from these threats. So basically, most of the defensive solutions nowadays, looking on the traffic, looking on some events on the operating system level, but if we go deeper inside the firmware and hardware, it's nothing there. I mean, nothing to see something which is exist. Let's talk a bit about evolution of persistence techniques. And I think the mitigations against malware persistence, it's raising the bar, but actually this bar have a limitation of the complexity because the bar is always a minimal level of the common techniques, but it's never co cover everything else. We can see here some uh, evolution and actually how this bar works. We have a rootkit and code signing policy for kernel models start blocking this kind of threads. Bootkits actually was evolution of the rootkits because they want to bypass the sign-in policy, getting execution before the operating start, a system starts and verify all the drivers, right? And secure boot actually was introduced just because we want operating system have more visibility on the boot process and trust the boot chain transition to the bootloaders of the operating system. But think about the BIOS plans and hardware threads so if we think about of the evolution of the modern threads, it's always getting to the direction closer and closer to the hardware and firmware side. And also it's grow the complexity of stealth techniques. Let's talk about the types of the persistent. We have a lot of EDR, endpoint solution, threat hunting tools, managed response, and all of them mostly focus it on the memory, operating system, user mode, kernel mode, bootloaders, boot sectors, but 
not hardware and firmware anymore. Oh, actually, not anymore. It's never been focused there. We have some antivirus solutions, which is use old techniques, which is actually they using on the operating system level and collecting the data, dumping the firmware from the operating system, but it's not enough, because if you have implant inside the firmware, it can fake everything else, right? Um, I was writing this book, and especially we was focusing on evolution of the threads chapter by chapter and getting to the firmware threads too. But it's not about the book, it's about this cover art. And you can see here is a Kraken, and some, a little guy with a boat tried to escape from the Kraken. And it's the truth about uh, this cover and some idea behind. The guy in the bot, it's a malware researcher, and hardware and firmware threads, unfortunately, is a blind spot just because for covering this trade landscape, you should have a hardware and silicon level uh, background to basically understand that. But if you just have a silicon and hardware and firmware level background and don't have a malware research background, you basically don't have uh, skills to detect these threads. And this disconnection create limitations on this threat landscape for develop the right solutions. But also, the hardware industry is not very supportive to provide us the sensor and telemetry to understand how we can raise some information to and uh, events to detect this kind of threats. Let's talk about the golden age of bootkits and rootkits, and mostly it was, uh, became on the scene because the cybercrime actors want a persistent goals. The main driver for raising the rootkits on a Windows operating system, it was a spam bots and DDoS bots in the past. And actually, state-sponsored actors was kind of like interested in these techniques to gain the persistence for the long term on the infected hosts, right? But golden age of the firmware and hardware implants, it ha happening right now. And you know why? Because nobody's seeing it. But we have some examples, which is actually uh, show us the problem is exist. This picture uh, have a two sides. One side is a researcher's proof of concept, and other side it's a real implants mostly detected in the wild. And as we can see, it's not a lot of implants for the firmware was detected. And if you pay attention, most of these threads was known just because of information leaks. Hacking team, Vault 7, and others. But if you look, how many proof of concepts been developed by the researchers, and I think it's a good proof how these threads can be developed and really persist in our system. I always actually ask it the question on my presentation, how many people updating their BIOS firmware on laptops or workstations after acquiring them from the market? And usually, I don't get a lot of raised hands because usually we buy the hardware and forget about that, right? So. We just work on the operating system level, but other, <laughs> anything else, we just don't pay attention much. And number of incidents actually with the firmware increases every year, and we can see a lot of things coming, especially on the hardware side. And everybody actually talking about the supply chain problems this year, especially on Shadow Hammer from ASUS Tech, because ASUS Tech Shadow Hammer shows the software being compromised, it's deliver a lot of, it can be deliver a lot of updates for operating system level, but think about, it also can update the firmware. And if you're inside the firmware, you can get a physical access to the memory, you can compromise a lot of interesting stuff. We will talk about that later. But 
Let's talk about the mitigations. So, and uh, this slide actually show how many things we have on the higher levels of the stack, but honestly on the bias and firmware level, we have a zero visibility. And most of um, security features, which is the hardware vendors provide us, as example, bias guard, boot guard, and others, it was actually weak for many types of attack. And personally myself, uh, in the past three years, I was uh, proven on my Black Hat talks, boot guard is vulnerable, and this year about the bias guard. So we don't have much to prevent the firmware threats, but think about, I like the initiative from the Apple, they first in the industry from the operating system developers released, publicly released the tool which is actually, if you use OS6, it's installed on every Mac, uh, if I check. Basically, what this tool does, it collects um, the firmware from the operating system level and checks the integrity and some anomaly settings for, for, the, for your system firmware. If something wrong, it will be raised some information. What is the problem? It's not scale. And also scale the integrity checks, raise a lot of false positives, because in update process for millions of the system, some, something can go wrong. And if you check in the integrity, only one bit change can affect the integrity check. And I talked with the Apple folks, and actually <laughs> they have a lot of, a lot of um, information from the users, but not really a lot of success on detecting something malicious. So other example, it's antivirus company, which is basically detect uh, threats and parse UEFI firmware images in the same way. And I think it's one of the first antivirus engines who start doing that, and it's a good example. But my opinion, firmware, it's not only like Dixie, drivers, which is uh, special executables on the firmware side for most of modern computers, use a PE format. But parsing PE format, as you're doing for the malicious threats on the operating system level, doesn't make sense because you will be losing a lot of uh, specifics and metadata focused on the firmware side. And I think modern antivirus engines who collect the firmware have a lot of data, but they processing not correctly. It's why we don't see much. And I collect some ideas about the challenges and limitations for um, antivirus solutions. Uh, basically, what is con can be go wrong and why it's not a problem solving solution anyway. It's good, it's to do something, it's always good. You can uh, spot some threat if you get lucky enough, but think about everything it can be fake after the system boots. If you have BIOS implant in your system firmware, it can disable any endpoint solution on the operating system level. So you will be, don't get anything from your dump, right? All the BIOS updates can be reinforced or just blocked from the BIOS implant side. It is no trusted path of the transition from the UEFI firmware to antivirus engine for some telemetry or cooperation to basically provide trusted path of events or something. And of course, supply chains, which is mostly focused, as example, you buying from Amazon on any other internet market, new laptop, but you not control the way how the, this laptop coming to you. And actually, if you not pay attention enough, it's very easy to just open your laptop, reprogram the spy flash with some malicious stuff and deliver to you. But probably individuals, very rare, became a targets of these threats. But if we talk about the data centers, it's much more interesting because 
sometimes it's hundreds or thousands of new hardware came in the same moment, and how we can check if something wrong with the firmware which is already there. Another interesting idea is who watch the watchers, right? We have the hardware developers, and we can see actually last few years a lot of attacks on silicon level, especially in microarchitecture. And in my opinion, it's raised a very, very interesting point. We have focused a lot on the software, but nobody pay attention to the hardware for years. And now we don't have any good solution to manage how we can trust this hardware, even if it comes from the trusted vendor, because somebody on the fab can compromise the line of producing servers for, spe for specific customer. Also, BIOS became a foundation for cloud security. Think about, we have uh, a lot of good examples and even it's uh, Lambda concept, um, PCI Screamer uh, proof of concept. It's like a PCI board with FPGA Arctic 7, which you can program as a PCI device and put on the server and try to reproduce direct memory access DMA attack. So, okay, this one is big, right? So it's feasible for you if something appears on, 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 on your server. But think about this one. Uh, it's a PCIe device with Arctic 7, but much more smaller. And it can actually be installed on your laptop and how many people opening their laptops to spot something after they acquiring the laptops from the market? Probably very close to zero, right? Because uh, modern laptops became thin and thin, and it's very hard to open and actually make it uh, beautiful as it was in the beginning without breaking anything, right? So this kind of devices, it's just the mainstream devices from the market. But uh, if you think about the attacker direction, it's a lot of ideas how you can develop this kind of solution on smaller chips. Also, many people will be say, oh, we have a uh, IOMMU, which is basically VTD blocking DMA attacks on the boot process. But think about VTD technology developed by Intel is also need to be initialized on some level. But uh, the thing is, power on the platform will be applied to the devices much earlier. And if your device power it earlier than VTD is enabled, you have pretty big window to an opportunity for the attack to be successful. Uh, Dmitry Alexiuk uh, show the very interesting concept with uh, Rush PCIe device and uh, show actually architectural problem in the framework uh, which is used for all the firmwares on modern platforms to be developed from Intel. It's uh, EDK2. And honestly, Intel developed the patch, but patch not solve who problem, I would say, it's prevent particular attack type, which is Dmitry presented. In other case, we need more visibility from the operating systems and operating system vendors. And think about, we're talking about the device health on enterprise, le enterprise level. Uh, Microsoft uh, developed Windows Device Guard which is actually have a lot of internals. And by the way, it's not a lot of information how many things from device guard you have in your firmware. And here is some, which is I spotted on American Megatrends firmware. And I think it's a reference code, which is has any firmware for modern laptops, 
uh, proposed by Microsoft. Basically, what they need, they need to understand this transition between firmware to operating system, it was not faked. As example, how you know the secure boot is really enabled? You need basically have some driver executed in trusted place and spot secure boot is enabled or lock in some configuration. And uh, Microsoft did that with a security testability specification HSTI and also device guard has a direct feedback loop from the operating system level. I really wish antivirus vendors and endpoint solutions will behave the same, but uh, not all of them have enough power to push uh, hardware vendors provide this opportunity to them. Also very interesting point, Microsoft uh, just not yesterday, I think it was at one day they announced on their con conference, Ignite, uh, about um, they develop a new ATP opportunity for hunting firmware threats at scale, which is quite interesting. And they spot in some configuration problems. But what I really wish, they will be not catch only the vulnerable configurations in supply chain. They will be catch something real and make it public because we need more information and visibility about the firmware threats to gain our awareness on the whole industry. But not all the vendors actually is the same. The vendors like Gigabyte, Asus Tech, Astrock, MSI, they just don't care about security. If you look on this screenshot, it shows uh, some dump from the Chipsec tool, which is a public tool for the firmware assessment, and it shows actually the path for read and write your system firmware in the spy flash chip, it's not protected. So you can, even if it's signed firmware, you can just go uh, on the back way and write it, modify it, and it will be good. On another side, we have a lot of limitation for forensics and reverse engineering because think about, okay, we have the full system simulation like a CIMIX from Intel, actually wind river, but Intel use it a lot. And um, if we don't provide the hardware specifics and uh, EFI protocols, which is kind of like an API level for the Dixie driver, which I mentioned before, it creates a lot of limitation. You can just take malicious driver and execute on this environment. Also, UEFI emulation, like QEMO, have the same problem. You can emulate some basic stuff, but if you don't know what the configuration are on your particular device or execution environment, you will be not able to reproduce it. Hardware level debugging, like a DCI, when you can connect a USB dongle to your laptop and debug your firmware in, in, in the way of connecting to CPU, it's very limited and actually it's provided mostly for the test and um, configuration and QA for the factories. Sometimes it's unlocked or it's not difficult to unlock, but it's not a proper way to go there for forensics because nobody provide as a legit solution for that. Um, here is a, actually an uh, example of debugging system firmware from, um, from Intel uh, system tools. And um, actually also T-Train solution um, is very interesting because um, some French company T-Train developed the full time travel debugging for, for the whole operating system and also they've been uh, catching some very late stages on the Dixie. You can't actually debug the full system firmware, but you can catch something. Also, Hydro Pro actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of features for automatic parsing, as example, for the context and the main functions and initialize some uh, particular protocols in uh, UFI Dixie drivers, which is good. So welcome to the brave new world. And I don't have a good solution, but I have more things to scare you guys. Um, 
UEFI update process is a chaos, right? And um, if you basically attack the legit updating tools, like I mentioned before with the shadow hammer uh, supply chain attack on the ASUS stack, you can basically flash the firmware with a signed driver without any antivirus raise any particular alert. So, yes, we have a BIOS guard and um, we have some coverage of the signed uh, firmware volumes on the spy flash, but usually it's not cover the full flash and have some limitations. Also, this screenshot, I really like it because when you have a large enterprise company with the thousands of the machines, you can't go and update the BIOS manually, right? So you can't go and disable the boot guard to do it so. You need some way with the Active Directory or other enterprise tools to make it for all the users in the same manner and time. And this screenshot showing how boot guard disabled remotely. But what is the problem here? If the system administrator can disable boot guard, the attacker also can, right? I was um, trying to learn about generic paths of updating the system firmware on Microsoft. And they have a component firmware update, which is very good idea when you have a um, generic way to update the system firmware on the Windows operating system level. What is the problem here? Oh, if you read developer to do, the firmware basically not mandatory should be signed. And you can deliver unsigned updates, which is raise some red flag, at least for me, because I believe if the firmware not signed, it can be easily fake it, right, or modify it. Another uh, very good initiative, it's a Linux vendor firmware service, LVFS, and they develop for the Linux system quite the same way of generic, delivering generic updates for USB controllers, for the system firmwares, and it's a really good initiative. I talked with uh, Richard Hedges uh, recently, and uh, I raised this idea about like, why we're not implementing at least something simpler like a Yara rules on the, on the firmware images before it's getting to the customers, at least to detect some simple supply chain problems. And he recently implements that, and we see how many problems it appears. But let's talk about actually how you can really exploit the system with your BIOS remotely. It's actually quite expensive because your exploit chain should be have something with remote code execution on the browser, office, or something, which is, will be basically elevate the privileges to the kernel mode, and kernel mode actually can talk to some UEFI services directly. At least it's, we're talking about the five or six um, chain, stages of the chain to get there. But if we think about the logics, which is being discovered last year and a part of APT28, they was using some proof of concepts presented by researchers about like years ago, and it still was working fine. So in the re realistic picture, this exploit chain will be not a really expensive if you go the large scale, but it will be expensive if you want to attack the particular target. And it's different motivation, so. And here is the end point of execution for payload, it's SMM. It's one of the most privileged mods on the x86 system, system management mod. But think about, for modern servers, you don't really need a persistence on SpyFlash chip because 
uptime for the server, it's much longer. And even like newer laptop, you don't uh, need like, you, you don't reboot your system really frequently, right? So you just close the lid and it's go to the sleep or hibernate state. So SMM runtime persistent, I think it's more efficient than we think about. And why the golden age of firmware hardware appliance is happening right now? I think the firmware is a new big thing for the attackers and for the state sponsored attackers it's been quite a while in the game and we have a lot of problems which is basically should pay more attention from who industry and pay more awareness on the hardware side too. But main thing, nowadays everything goes to the cloud, right? And think about, in the cloud it's very difficult to control the supply chain and modern servers, it's just a cloud instance of VM, right? It's not really you have your physical machine anymore. You have a server from the cloud provider, but your instance is just VM. So let's talk about that a bit because I believe, um, I believe it's a lot of things can be a problem there too. But before we go and talk about the clouds, let's focus on the persistent classification. And I think we can split the persistent classification for the firmware threads on two big groups. It's compromised supply chain or results of exploitation. And actually, I think we already covered most of them on the previous slide, but basically, so compromised supply chain, it's about weak configuration or somebody intentionally change this configuration on the way the server to the data center. Result of exploitation, it's more about you need a vulnerability on the system and then basically you get there for gain persistence in execution runtime for SMM or something else. Problem for most of the vulnerabilities in the firmware, average time for patching in it six to nine months, which is a lot, right? So it's almost a year you have one day. And it's why even it's a lot of stages in the chain it can be very cheap for the attacker. Also, we have a lot of challenges of understanding the attacker tactics and creating the right mitigation in related to mindset and differences between attacker and architect. Think about the security architect thinking about new mitigation, but he never writes the exploit, right? Or attack tool, or even use it. It's why offensive security research, it's not equal to just their usual security research because why a lot of big companies like Nvidia, Intel, Oracle, Google, and many others um, try to have offensive security research team internally just because they have, they want to develop this expertise and prevent problems before it goes to the market and have a more realistic picture on their mitigation and security technologies as well. And mitigation design is actually not equal to security architecture just because if you think on one particular attack and design the mitigation to block one exploit, it doesn't make sense, right? You need to develop something which is will be block entire class of vulnerabilities and this one, it's not easy, and it's why I raise these points here. I would say internal offensive team, it's kind of like a telemetry and which is gain reality for the company of understanding of current state of the security for their technologies. Let's go back to the cloud and look on this picture. We have like server machine which is running some cloud virtual machines and if we have a protected hardware, everything looks good, right? So everything is green because we have trusted hardware which is have 
trusted secure boot and boot everything, right? But if the attacker targeting particular VM instances and all the VM instances actually have their own virtual bias, I was seeing some problems when uh, enterprise vendor for the server provide particular instance the rights to update the system firmware. Think about, if you compromise one instance, you can go directly to flash your system firmware. But many cases they isolate from the external network, this VM image and other things for basically not going to happen. But think about, if you make these rights for writing the system firmware for VM image for one machine, that's mean on the hypervisor level, this privilege exists for others too. It's just not exist on the particular VMs, but if you gain elevate of privilege, privileges to the hypervisors, you will be able to attack this path too from any machine. So if you have compromised hardware, everything is go wrong because attacker can, as example from the system firmware, have a direct access to the memory and modify VM configuration, VMCS instances, or like read it, parse it, and find all the virtual machines and have a direct access to the memory. Okay, if hardware is okay, then a system firmware, but if system firmware is okay, let's talk about the guest bias, and I think it's very important point because we don't talk a lot about that. And what I found in the wild recently this summer, sp spy flash descriptor on the CBIOS and the court board configuration for some large enterprise Linux distribution was not configured correctly. What does that mean? Basically, this vulnerability allow you, even if you have the signed way to update your BIOS, you can basically with this vulnerability bypass because flash descriptor described which regions you can override. And this vulnerability can allow you to override the spy flash memory without any permissions. A actually, here is the permissions given. So you have a permissions if vulnerability exists. Some of the firmwares also have a write protection region problem, but it's easy vulnerability to spot. Not all of them does this one. What is the problem with the virtual bias? Same, you have virtual machine introspection, but you don't have a virtual machine bias detection mechanism. Also sometimes, I seen it just the one time, but it was really funny. When one vendor tried to share one virtual bias between multiple virtual machines, and I gained escape when I basically attacked the virtual bias, and because it was accessible to other instances, uh, so basically, the file on the file system, it's replicate for all the instances. If you modify the file on the file system, you basically can manage to get in any virtual machines after it's rebooted. It was fun. So, yeah. CBIOS and Core Boot by default have a weak configuration. And it was a funny situation because I came to the vendor and say, guys, you have a problem. And they say, oh, we use a core boot. So go to the core boot and tell them we have a problem because they not configured their security features. I came to core boot owners and they say, mm, you know what? By default, we don't configure anything. We put to the shoulders of the vendor this uh, type of configuration for security because it's not generic and it really depends on the vendor awareness and a lot of things. And basically, who will be in charge of this problem? It was difficult, but we managed to fix it. So, and um, big cloud providers actually have a lot of technologies like a shielded VM by Google, by Microsoft and uh, Oh, actually, shielded VM by Google, but armored VMs by Microsoft, and uh, Amazon did their some uh, other thing, but in the same direction. That means they try to lock every machine with configuration and with a bias just to not allow you to do what I just described. 
but still any VM guest bias, it's out of scope for security solutions. Other thing which I want to describe is ba base, baseboard management controller, BMC. And um, BMC is small chip which is exists on any server for the remote management. <laughs> BMC has their own Ethernet controller on the chip. And actually, it also can update the BIOS. So here are some links with uh, research done the last year from Airbus when they managed to gain remote exploit on the opera uh, real-time operating system on the BMC and basically update the system BIOS, leverage the privileges of uh, BMC to do so. Other big problem, which is we, everybody talking about, but not all of the people understand the complexity of the problem is huge. So we have the chip design company, but how many chip design companies have their own factory for basically create the silicon, create the actual chip? Not a lot, right? And you send your design to the fab. Fab create your chip and then basically chip going back with some test first model to the company who designed the chip. You test it and then you make a series of basically just to repeat the same chip for many users. But also we have a lot of distributors, OEM, I see vendors, I mean, when you basically have a, some circuit design, you have a lot of components on it, right? And as example, if you think any hardware vendor develops a full platform themselves, that's not true. As example, USB controller always is the third party, which is have their own firmware. In many cases, the platform vendor even doesn't have access to the source code. They just get assigned binaries and they trust them, which is create a huge, huge hole in the supply chain. But if you ask me a question why, just because it will be cheaper to not have access to the source code. I really like this screen because it's described in very simple picture all the problems in supply chain. And it's been presented on Blue Cut Israel by Andrew Juan uh, Bunny, very great presentation. I highly recommend you guys to look on it. Another thing which I just mentioned with USB for controller firmware, we really trust everything which has come from the vendor and sign it, right? We don't have any visibility what is inside. And it's became really a huge, huge blind spot for that. And Howard Flake spot Thomas Dulian spots this problem in his keynote a few years ago. Why actually hardware vendors don't think about the security in the first place? <laughs> I would say it's very difficult, but in most of the cases, security for the hardware vendor is just a customer needs, so basically they develop security features to sell more products. So I think here is some interesting situation where security not driven in intention to make device more secure in real picture. And also think about many hardware vendors say, oh, we have a technology bake it inside, inside the hardware which is protect the user. But sometimes if you go deeper, just one bit in the hardware chip which is locking something and they call this security technology. Yeah, it is, but it's not really hard to break it in many cases. I like this presentation from Trammell Hudson he did this year, and it was time to use, time to check attacks on the spy flash chips and bypass the boot guard technology from Intel. Basically, the main idea behind this was, okay, we have the spy flash chip, 
where our firmware is stored, and BIOS boot guard is verifying its, in, its integrity, right? But if it's authenticated once, that doesn't mean we should trust it forever. What that means exactly, after the system boots, boot guard never back to recheck the firmware integrity or it's checked on very early stage and you can fake it if you have a ability to write physically on SpyFlash chip other regions. It's what actually Trammell proved and here is a link on his presentation. Other thing, I don't know how many people is aware, but any Intel firmware have a lot of binary blobs called authenticated code models, which is x86 code and it's executed before operating system start mainly, but some of them even later. So, and it's not covered by boot guard because it's executed very early, even before boot guard started. The same thing about the microcode, and I think it's raised interesting point about downgrade attacks, right? So, if it's not protected, why? we not don't great microcode or ACMs with vulnerabilities which we already know and try to attack it in runtime. So I think this problem was covered already on Hackers to Hackers conferences a few weeks ago uh, by Alex Yermolov in Sao Paulo. And um, I think it, it slides will be public soon so you can learn more about that. We have this discussion on Twitter where exactly I was talking about the downgrade directions and he spots these vulnerabilities and report to Intel. And it was real. So, and I think one more point we should always keep in mind, the code signing is really only one thing we should have to control our firmwares. And it's not enough. Third party component, so is a part of supply chain hell and we talked just a few slides ago about that. Any, any new chip on your hardware can extend attack surface and security boundaries usually built around one chip but not building around full platform and this point, it will be for my k not and zero nights on the next week. But for good picture on it, I think TPM, root of problems, because Jeremy Boone was spotting UFI Genie when you can have a man in the middle attack on the communication channel between TPM chip and the system firmware and Trammel Hudson just solder some wires directly to use the uh, TPM and fake it something for system firmware too. Major vendors try to fix the root of trust with their own chips. Apple with T2, Google with Titan, Microsoft with Cerberus, and Amazon with Greengrass. But problem, it's still a chip on the platform. It has the traces to communicate with other components. And attack surface is quite big there anyway. And my point is, if we say like we have the chip which is now bake root of trust inside the hardware, I don't think it solves everything. Still, it's verify on the boot, but not solve as example runtime exploitation. So for the secure boot, I would say it's a game changing in many cases, but not for everything in terms of firmware security. Also, Google just uh, recently, two days ago, open source their Titan chip and silicon with RTL, and the firmware is available. But I would say it's a bit different than they use on their servers, but it's really big step for open computing, and this design is quite good. So main point, any hardware vendors doesn't have full control on their supply chains and a lot of third parties binaries blob can create huge problem for security. 
Operation Shadow Hammer we spotted multiple times in our presentation. I will be just leave this slide. But what I want to say, researcher arm race really continue and not never stops because we have a lot of problems and for creating meaningful solutions for these problems, we really need to go deep with this vulnerabilities inside the hardware, firmware, and create good security solution. But without who industry awareness, I don't think it's possible. But we're doing the steps in this direction together. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think it's it for today. I hope I have some time for the question, and for the best question, I will give away this book. We Thank you it. so much, Alex. Thank you. We do have time for two questions. So let's try to make it super effective. Plus, you get one of these hats along with Alex's book. So we're going to pass around just, yeah, we have one over here. Can we get a mic? It's coming. OK. <laughs> Hi. Thanks for the presentation. So my question is a bit more general in the sense, do you, do you think, as an industry, some of these issues are because of a perception problem where we treat like hardware and firmware or firmware in particular different than software because we call it firmware but actually it's software and everything is software and when, when we think about like you mentioned base bad management controllers or Intel ME, Intel AMD which are basically operating system, real time operating systems running alongside your real operating system on the same, on the same machine do you think vendors have this mindset of we are hardware vendors, we don't do software, we do hardware? And that's what caused some of these design issues where security is lacking by design? So it's a very good question. So um, first thing what I want to say, in many cases, security is a tool for s selling more products for the hardware vendors. And your question was, OK, these vendors, keeping in mind, about security for basically architecting these things. And it really depends because many people involved on like developing EME even. And um, the problem is, which as I mentioned about architects and mitigation design. And all the operating system for EME, I believe, developed by usual architects. They don't have this security mindset, how it can be broken or it's based on some information which they read, which is, can be just old, you know? It's why, as example, back two years ago, we have a code execution box from positive technologies on management engine, right? CSME. And uh, even modern days, like actually Google mentioned in the news, the main driver for open, uh, for developing the Titan chip was because they try to prevent root of trust from being an ME and transfer to their own piece of silicon because EME have the Minix operating system inside and it's very known piece of software and even open source and easier to create the attack and newer EME chips use x86 not ARC which is also easier to exploit because it's a lot of knowledge on x86 exploitation, right? If I can follow up short, uh, a bit. So what I'm saying is that we have this perception of, of software security being more mature because it's been, uh, uh, it's been scrutinized uh, for a few decades now, right? But we accept the fact that hardware is not. So we see this like this is the new thing. Why haven't hardware vendors, they had not enough time to implement secure software development life cycles if they viewed themselves as also software vendors, they could have implemented some of the same solutions that software vendors have. In many cases, hardware, if bug exists, uh, as example, and it's related to hardware, in many cases, it can be just firmware doesn't use hardware correctly. So because in many companies, even who develop the hardware solutions, teams who develop the firmware or like higher stack operating systems not connected to the hardware engineers and it's creating some spot where this misunderstanding can lead some architectural bugs. 
Thank you. Yeah, okay, so just one more very super quick question uh, over here since the mic is closer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick question. You, uh, as we've seen, the, when we do the trusted boot, it just ignores the ACM uh, piece of code. Can we not run a hash algorithm on top of it and compare it after the secure boot, as in do this comparison constantly? You mean like we, you just want to check the integrity for ECM, right? Yes. So I think integrity is good, but what you should do, you should check all the headers. As example, entry point of ECM was not changed yet. The timestamp of ECM model was not changed yet. And of course, integrity for the code. Yeah, I think it's the right point to create at least some barrier for prevent malicious ACMs, downgraded ACMs executed on the platform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, for the time being, that's not done at all. So it could yeah. be a small step. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for the questions. Thank you very much. I would uh, uh, award the first question just because uh, the person raised industry problem and I think it's very important to discuss was very important to discuss here uh, what is your name okay which uh, you are the winner of the bootkit rootkits book and uh, I will sign it for you just after I leave the stage <laughs> awesome awesome so thank you so much thank you Lucian you always ask the best questions thank you <laughs> thank you everybody it was a pleasure to speak on this stage.